Good morning. How's everyone? We are here to praise you, Jesus. Family of God. You guys doing well? Come on, let's sing this together. Like this. the way, the truth, and the life. Troubled times, it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. I'll humble all I am, all to you. That's why we sing. same God that never fails will not fail me now. As you won't fail me now, is in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you high. You know, that's biblical even through the lowest of valleys we still praise we choose to praise and see God work in your life sing count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you 
our firm foundation. He's the reason we have hope for the future and to have a, a life with him as well in heaven. For his grace, we thank you.
Good morning, fellowship. I hope you're doing well. Um, there's, as we just continue in worship, there's several ways that you can give here. Uh, you can give online. You can give in the boxes if you're in person uh, at the back of the worship center, down the hallway as you exit. Uh, you can text to give. You can mail your tithe or offering in as well. And it's whatever you feel the most comfortable with. That's, that's, that's totally fine with us. Listen, as we were, as we were worshiping this, this, this morning, sometimes we just need to be reminded of his blood. That his blood totally and completely forgives us. We are totally and completely forgiven in him because of the blood that he shed for us on the cross. Not some of our sins, not part of our sins, but we are totally and completely forgiven this morning. And so maybe this morning, maybe you just need to be reminded of that. That in him you are deeply loved. In him you are perfect and complete. You stand in his righteousness and totally and completely forgiven. In a few moments, we're going to open up the scriptures together. and We're going to walk through 2 Corinthians. And there's a verse in there to where Paul is talking. And he's talking about this thorn in the flesh, this issue he had. And he prayed several times that the Lord would heal him. And he prayed several times. The fact is, it was a continuous prayer. That God would remove this thorn out of his life. But something happened in Paul's life. And Paul came to the place to, he, to where he realized that when I am weak, I am strong. That God used weaknesses in my life to pull me closer to him, to trust in him and not in self. So maybe this morning, as we just continue to worship, maybe you just need to be, be reminded. Maybe you're walking through a situation in your life and you prayed that God would remove this situation, that God would take care of this issue, Maybe that God would heal you or heal a family member. And maybe today, maybe you just need to understand that guess what? His grace, his grace is sufficient. And he will never, he will never let me go. As we continue in worship, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace. And Father, we thank you that we are forgiven. We thank you that you went to the cross on our behalf. You who knew no sin became sin for us. And you were crucified and on the third day you rose again. And because of that we are we're forgiven. And so we thank you for grace. Father, we thank you for grace even when we walk through difficult times. That maybe today maybe something would happen as we realize that it's in those moments in life that you pull us very closely to you and that's sometimes when our faith deepens as we just continue in worship for we ask these things in Jesus name amen Sometimes I fall in my wandering, but through it all, there's just one thing more precious than the air I breathe. Grace, amazing grace, unfailing grace, that saves my soul grace unending grace unrelenting grace that won't let go sing this with me you took our sin you took our stain you took our guilt now there is no shame this time That's 
singing grace that saves the soul. It's grace, unending grace, unrelenting grace that won't let go. Grace, grace, unending grace, unfailing grace that saves. God, we accept it. We, we exalt you in this moment. We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory that you deserve and that no one else deserves. And Father, we trust you and we ask you to be in our lives in every aspect, at home, at work, at the grocery store, God, as we spread your love to others, as we give a smile, as we say thank you, as we do something kind and show your love that others would be saved, God. And we just trust you, Lord, and we're excited to hear a word from you through Pastor Charlie. Speak through him, God. Talk to us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Well, hey there, everyone. My name's Brady. Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before this weekend's message, we'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around Fellowship. So check this out. Join us for the LifeWay Women's Simulcast on April 24th. This in-person and online event will be filled with practical Bible teaching with your favorite authors, such as Christy McClelland and Lisa Harper. Register online today. COVID-19 has caused us to be apart from people, and this can take a toll on our emotional health. Mental Health Mondays will help you process some of the emotions that you may have experienced during the past year. So join us online at 6.30 p.m. for Mental Health Mondays starting April 26th. These sessions are designed specifically to give you the tools needed to be emotionally and mentally healthy. If you are interested in baptism, we want to walk you through that decision. We're having baptisms the weekend of April 24th and 25th. So if you'd like to put your name on the list, please call the front office at 719-544-5000 or fill out a Connect card. Family Night is a great opportunity for you to worship and learn with your kids at their level, whether they're two years old or fourth graders. Join us April 29th at 6.30 p.m. for a fun night of food, games, worship, and God's Word. We are so glad to see you here this weekend. For more information on any events or ministries, please visit our website, fellowshipoftherockies.org, or check out the information desk in the foyer. Have a great week. Here's Pastor Charlie with a message. Good morning again. Good morning. We're glad you're here. And so if you, if you have your Bibles, electronic devices, you can click to turn to. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and so while you're finding your place, let me just tell you a couple of events that are coming up. Uh, ladies, if you'd like to sign up for the Lifeway event, it's Saturday at 8.30, I think it's 8.30 to 1.30. Uh, you can go out in the, the foyer and, and uh, at the info booth, uh, there will be someone there that can answer your questions. You can sign up, I think it's about $20. Uh, that includes lunch and snacks and your supplies and some of those other things. And then Mental Health Monday. Uh, is coming uh, April the 26th, and so you actually can go to our website, and that's how you would click into that. You can find more information there, and then, then April the 23rd, uh, 28th, it's a Wednesday night at, at 6.30 here, uh, that if you're interested in going to Israel with Karen and I in, in 2022, April the 22nd through, through May the, the 1st, it's a 10-day trip, uh, you can show up here Wednesday, April the 28th, 6.30 in this room, and then we'll answer, we will answer, 
we'll answer all of your questions. If I can't, I promise you, Karen can. And so, uh, so we'll answer all of your questions and help you understand uh, what that trip will, will look like. So again, if you have your Bibles, electronic devices, you can click to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to have to back up just a little bit uh, because if you were with us last weekend, uh, you know that I didn't finish. I didn't finish on this issue of spiritual maturity. So this is like spiritual maturity part two. Last week we only looked at two principles, and, and so this week we're going to pick up one of those principles, and we're going we're gonna to carry on, and we're going to look at this issue of, of spiritual maturity and what does spiritual maturity look like. And so just a little bit of review is last week we found out that in the Scriptures that spiritual maturity is revealed in two different ways. It's revealed in the choices that we're willing to make, and then it's re revealed in the sacrifices that we're willing to make. So it's found in our choices and our sacrifices. And so today we're going to go just a little bit, listen, we're going to go a little bit deeper uh, in this subject. And so uh, I met a family on, 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 uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, I was out in the foyer and I'm like greeting people and there's this family that came in. And for about a year they had been like online only. They found us in the pandemic online and so they've been viewing our services as a family and watching our services as a family. And so they came up and they're excited. This is like our first weekend here officially to be here live and in person. And so I'm getting their names and, and, and talking with them. And all of a sudden they had, a, they had a, a, a young boy that was in the family. And all of a sudden, you know, he just looked at me, up at me and says, wow, you're a lot taller in person than I thought you would be. And so it, it's, it's funny, right? It's funny that when we finally meet someone in person, that all of our perceptions may change. I mean, we may understand them differently. We may view them differently. Whenever we meet someone, and see, this is what we're talking about, this issue of spiritual maturity. We're talking about this issue of being able to see Jesus for who Jesus is. The disciples had horrible problems with this issue. The disciples, when you, when you look at the disciples, you realize that they, they struggled. They struggled with this issue. I mean, when, when Jesus was like into his ministry for like a year and a half, that Jesus gathers the disciples around and tells them he's going to go to the cross, he's going to be the persecuted Christ, he's going he's to suffer, he's going to die. On the third day, he's going to rise again. And Simon Peter like loses his mind, right? And Simon Peter says, no, you can't do that. And so Jesus looked at him and said, get ye behind me, Satan, and explained that, that this, is, this is what it's going to look like. See, Simon Peter looked at Jesus as this person that, that to follow him is like easy believism, or to follow him, there's no sacrifice, there's no choices that you have to make. You can even find this in John chapter 21, and this is where my verse for this year comes out of. In John chapter 21, that Jesus reinstates Simon Peter um, there over a fish breakfast. And, and so they're walking away, and Jesus tells Simon Peter, says, you know what? You're going to die a martyr's death. You're, you're, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to die a martyr's death. And then Simon Peter, see, that wasn't his picture of Jesus. And so Simon Peter turns and points to John and says, well, what about him? And, and he says, well, if I want John to remain until I come, what is that to you? And then here's my verse. It says, as for you, you follow me. You don't worry about everybody. As for, Simon Peter, as for you, as for you, you just follow me. And see, sometimes that's not our picture of Jesus, right? Sometimes our picture of Jesus, he just wants to answer all of our prayers, and we never go through any difficulty. We never go through any, any struggles. And, and then that he's there to answer every one of our prayers. And the, the disciples also, they, they struggled. Like when we looked at on, on Easter, Luke chapter 24, and they looked at Jesus kind of like a political Jesus. And that's the reason on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples missed Jesus. Verse 24, out of Luke 24, it says, well, we thought he was going to come. We thought he was going to come and, and take over. We thought he was going to come and rule. We thought he was going to come by political power. And all of a sudden, Jesus spoke into that. And so our goal as we mature in Christ is to be able to see Jesus as the scriptures say. The closer we come to him, the more we know him, all of a sudden we start seeing him as a persecuted Christ. We start seeing him as a resurrected Christ, and we see him differently. See, this is Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians is just totally honest. I mean, it's very transparent what he writes. And so this morning I have, I have three principles for you. And so, so here's the first one. Your, your, your maturity 
is revealed in your love for the local church. Your maturity and my maturity is revealed in our love for the local church. And so here's what Paul writes as we just back up a little bit. Verse 28, uh, Paul writes this. He says, not to mention other things. This is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. And so now then we get some insight into Paul's life as a pastor. He felt unbelievable pressure as a pastor. He felt unbelievable pastor, uh, a pressure as a pastor for the churches that he had planted, the churches that he had established, for the people that were attending his church. And, and Paul felt, he, he, he felt so much pressure. In fact, is there's times that Paul felt some failure. Remember last week when we looked at it and he says, and I, I say this to our shame when some people drifted, when some people believed some things that the scriptures didn't teach, all of a sudden Paul says, you know what, this is to our shame. In other words, if I had been a better leader, if I had been a better pastor, if I had been a better communicator, if I had been a better person, then maybe you would not have misunderstood this. You see this in Paul's life. Paul loved the people in the church. His love for them grew. You see this in his life to the church in Corinth. Remember, we've walked through this over and over. He's like, I'm pleading for you that there would be no division among you, that you would understand what it means to be of one heart, of one mind, that you would understand what it means to walk in unity. So the church of Corinth, he's like pleading with them with this issue. But the church in Galatia, it, it had a totally different issue. And he's pleading with them. He says, I, I cannot believe you're, you're drifting so quickly from this gospel of grace and you're going back to legalism you're going back to your old ways and, and and he felt some responsibility of that to the church in philippi he's like begging these two ladies he said please just learn to get along i mean the gossip and the slander has to stop would you just please learn to get along because you know what it's doing it is splitting the church it, it is hurting the, the local body and then the, the church in Colossae, he he says i just i just need you to know I just need you to know how much I'm struggling for you. I just need you to know how much I love you and I care for you. And then the church in Thessalonica, here's what he writes. We'll just read this one, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. He says, for this reason, when I could no longer stand it, I also sent him to find, find out about your faith, fearing, so here's his concern, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be for nothing. And all of a sudden, Paul is struggling about maybe, maybe I failed. Maybe all of my labor in Thessalonica, maybe, 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 well, what he says, it may have been for nothing. And Paul, listen, Paul, Paul loved the church. Well, actually, he loved the people in the church because that's what makes up a church, and he agonized for them. And here's the crazy thing about the Paul. Paul was a great insight into our life. Paul never gave up on people. Paul never quit on anyone. In the council culture that we live in, all it takes is to disagree with someone, and we cancel them out pretty quickly. Uh, we remove ourselves from them pretty quickly, but not Paul. Paul agonized over them. He prayed for them. He was concerned about them. And listen, Paul never quit on people, and, never, and neither should we. Just neither should we. I, I understand, especially after COVID, this pressure. For the first time in my ministry, I've, I've understood this pressure like no other time in my ministry about how do you properly minister to people? How do you take care of people? How do you pastor people in the season in which we live? And it is true, there are times I feel like that if I was just a better pastor, if I was just a better communicator, if I was just a better preacher, and sometimes, you know what keeps me up at night? Is trying to figure out how to minister to the marginalized, how to minister to the hurting. That's why, that's where this uh, Monday, um, whatever we call it, someone knows what is it? Mental Health Monday. Thanks. I need some mental health. I <laughs> and we went to Wings of Grace in Colorado Springs, which is a Christian counseling service. Dr. Bird was an ex-pastor, went back to school for a Ph.D. Unbelievable. So we, we just sat down and had, actually Pastor Dwayne did, we sat down and had a conversation with them and said, what are the top four or five things that your counselors are dealing with over and over and over in this season? And they told us, and they says, well, could we send, you know, Pastor Eli and Matt and some other people up there? Could we film these and then take and put them online to where it'd be very easy for you and your family, your friends, to be able to click in and, and walk through and hear from, a, hear from a licensed counselor who is a believer who will open up the word with you and help you, help you in, in this season. And, and so that's where, listen, 
James 1.27 says this. James 1.20 says, pure and undefiled religion before God is to take care of orphans and widows. And, what he, and, and then to keep yourself pure uh, and, and, and to grow and to mature in him. And he says, that's pure and undefiled religion, to take care of wid- orphans and to take care of widows. This issue of widows, is just re- it is really on my heart right now. I mean, in May, we're going to do something with orphans. We're going to sponsor orphans in, in Mimbezi, and we've established an orphanage in Haiti. We're doing unbelievable work in Mimbezi in this area. But I'm wondering if God is maturing our, tr- our church, and we need to do something even more intentional for the widows and widowers in our church. I mean, it seems like that I'm being faced with that everywhere I go. I've told you stories of, of how we care for some widows in, in our, in our, on our street. And then, then this other night, uh, Karen and I, every night, we, we, we walk and, and uh, we're walking home. And, and as we're walking home, I'm way more observant than her. And so uh, she would say it's nosy. Uh, and it's like none of my business. But sometimes God uses that. And so we're, we're walking home and... And all of a sudden, about four houses up on the opposite side of the street, uh, I see an elderly lady, and she's down on all fours in her front yard, and she's like rocking back and forth. And, and, I'm, and I'm watching her. And so finally I decide, you know what, I, I need, uh, Karen is, is like unaware, and so I need to bring her into this. And so I, 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 I try to whisper, because that, that is not my spiritual gift, right? I mean, my family tells me I cannot whisper. When I whisper, everybody in the room hears me. And so uh, I tried to the very best of my ability to tell Karen, I says, hey, is, is that lady up there, is she in trouble? And all of a sudden, Karen looked, and, and I mean, Karen looked both ways, and she shot across the, the, the street, and she says, come on. And when she got to the center of the street, she, she yells out to this lady, says, ma'am, ma'am, are you, are, are you okay? And all of a sudden, the lady turned beet red, and she says, well, embarrassingly enough, I'm not. She says, I think my hip's gone out, and I don't think I can get up. And so Karen's a nurse, and Karen asks some questions, because Karen is actually helpful in this. All I could do is pray for her, and so (laughs) so, uh, Karen assessed her, asked some questions, and said, ma'am, we're going to get you up. And she's like, no, I don't think you can get me up. And Karen's like, oh, yeah, we, we, we will get you up. And so she, Karen, you know, barked some orders at me and, and in a nice way. I didn't mean it like that. And so, uh, and, and so told me how to, how to support her. Uh, we lifted her up. And, and Karen is like assessing this lady to make sure she's okay. And all of a sudden, I looked down. And you know what this lady was doing? She was repairing her sprinkler system. And she was pretty impressive. She had all the right tools. I mean, I was, I'm, a, I'm like, man, you got all the right tools. And so then, then when Karen realized that the lady was okay, uh, I looked at her and says, ma'am, we would love to help you. Ma'am, we would love to help, you know, fix your, your sprinkler system. We'll do anything we can to help you. And so, you know, she, she looked at me and she says, well, that's really sweet of you, but nobody can do this to my level. And I go, okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, if you ever get to the point, I I didn't sleep much that night. We do some things to support widows in our church. Our go team, our deacons, they do some things. I mean, we've, we've fixed swamp coolers. We've, uh, we've rebuilt decks for some of the widows in our church. We've done chores around the house and through, through the pandemic. Uh, we've gotten meds for widows. We've gone and gotten groceries and some other things. And so I am, wo- I am just wondering if God has laid this on my heart. Maybe there's some of you in this room that say, you know what, God's laid, th- that, that's a ministry that I, c- I could get behind to where we take the widows and widowers of our church and then build community that not only meets physical needs but meets emotional needs, that meets spiritual needs. Because here's what James says. James says that pure and undefiled religion is caring for orphans and widows. It's caring for the, the marginalized of society. And what would it what would happen if we developed a ministry with one intention of linking deacons and, 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 and go team and, and ministry partners together to care for widows? See, that's what kept Paul up. That's the stuff that keeps me up at night. 
When I hear that you have needs that aren't being met, when I hear that you're having struggles, it always puts pressure on me and, and the, to where I wonder if I was just maybe a better pastor, if I was a better communicator, if I, if I understood this differently, maybe we could meet some more needs in our congregation. So if that's you, you want to have a conversation with me or, or Pastor Beth, then, then we, would, we, would love, we would just love to hear from you. Uh, fact is, I, this is just for free, but here's an amazing thing. This lady came up to me, and she's been in our church forever. She came up to me after the Saturday night service because I said the same thing. She came up to me in the Saturday night service and says, you're not going to believe this. Says, my, my mother, and she told me where she lives. She doesn't live in Pueblo. She says, my mother is a widow. My mother started a widow's ministry in her church. And so she says she calls it uh, Widow Wednesday. And so on, win on every Wednesday, Wednesday is her widow's ministry. She has a spiral notebook. It is up to over 70 widows. And she personally calls every one of them. Prays for them. Ask them if they have any needs. And then she works to meet their needs. So if that's you, we'd love to hear from you. Verse 29, here's, here's what he says. Paul goes on and says, Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? I do not burn with indignation. And so Paul came to this place to where he understood that as we mature in Christ, our love for the local church should not diminish. Our love for the local church should grow. We live in a time, we live in a, in, in, in a period of, of church history that it seems like that the longer people are in church or the longer people are, are walking with Jesus, that their love for the local church, it doesn't grow, but it, 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 like, it like diminishes. And I mean, I mean we're, the church is an easy target right now, right? I mean, it seems like a lot of people are complaining about all churches in America. And I, I saw on, uh, on social media, actually had someone tell me this a couple of weeks ago, says, Jesus, yes, the church, no. You can't separate them. The church is like, is, is like the bride of Christ, and he's the groom. And you can, listen, you cannot separate them. John 13, 35 says, but this, by this... Everyone will know that you're my disciples. What? If you love one another. And the way that we love one another is within the local church. The way that we love one another is, is how we minister to one another, how we pray for one another, how we encourage one another. And Paul is reminding them of who they are. Verse 27, he goes on. Now, you're the body of Christ and individual members of it. And Paul was helping them to understand in, in different phrases. 1 John 3.16, I know you're probably familiar with John 3.16. Here's what 1 John 3.16 says, and it says this. This is how we come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down, down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Do you realize that is the number one reference that is the number one title for people in the local church was brothers and sisters you may have in, in your spiritual history you may have gone to a church that took that so literal that you referred to everybody you know brother bob and and brother bill or, or or sister betty or whatever and you referred to people within the church brother and sister this is what they're trying to do they're trying to remind themselves that guess what we're a family and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so there's some people that will tell you, right? There's some people say, oh, wait a minute. I'm a, part of the, I'm a part of the universal church. But I'm not a part of the local church. In other words, I'm a part of the big C church. I'm not a part of the little C church. But can I tell you this? Only two times in scripture, especially in the New Testament, does it even talk about the universal church. Most of the time, 97% of the times in the New Testament, when the word ecclesia, those that are called out, is used... It's talking about the local church. Now watch this. I want you to see this in Scripture. Because look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. The Scripture says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, Timothy, our brother, to the church of God. So now then he's making reference to universal church, okay? So this is so important for us to understand theologically how you cannot separate the two. The church of, uh, the church of God at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, Grace to you, peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you look at this, you look at each community, however small, represents the total community. In other words, this, when we gather together, we're part of the universal church. 
When we gather together, it's the manifested presence of God in a local assembly. And so we're linked to all the churches that, are, that, that believe in Jesus in our community, in Africa and Haiti and around the world, to where you cannot separate out the two. And the way that we express our faith and love for one another is within the local church. And so that's why. That's why Paul says we minister to the hurting. He goes on in verse 26 and says, So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And I've watched in this church, especially this last year, how life groups ministered to one another, how life groups ministered to other families. We, we have had a couple of families the last two weeks that have gone through ma major crisis, major crisis in this church. And I have, watched, I have watched their life group gather around hospital rooms, uh, join with them at a funeral, minister to them, help them, met their needs, uh, took them meals, met any kind of need that they had. And then Paul goes on in verse 29 and says, Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. If boasting is necessary, I will boast about my weakness. See, that's kind of strange for us, right? Usually, what do we boast in? We boast in our strengths. We boast in our giftedness. Not Paul, because Paul understood something totally different. I will boast about weaknesses. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us forever, who knows that I am not lying. I don't know if you've ever realized this. It's been true in my life. That a weakness can become a strength. A weakness in your life. Or maybe you're better at, at, at using the word limitation. Maybe the word weakness is like too intimidating to you. But a limitation, because when we have a limitation, when we have a weakness, what does it do? It forces us to trust Christ even deeper. This is Paul. And sometimes a weakness in your life can become a strength. I, I, I love these rags to riches stories uh, where someone had nothing and then all of a sudden they, they had a successful company or successful business. And so I picked up a book with like a lot of short stories about this. And, and one of my favorites was happened in Kentucky a number of years back. Uh, there was this man that, that went to the First Baptist Church there in his town in Kentucky. He said, listen, I am not a beggar. I have lost my job. I need money. I will, I will do anything. I, I will work for, for wages. And they says, okay. And so they asked him to mow the lawn. And so he mowed the lawn, and he was tenacious in what he did. He was a hard worker. And so they kept giving him one thing after another. And after about a month and a half of this, all of a sudden the pastor came to him and said, hey, listen, we want to hire you as our janitor. I mean, your work ethic, you, your, your eye to detail, it's amazing. And so we want to hire you as our janitor. And the guy goes, and so then the pastor handed him some employment forms, and the man says, well, he says, I'm so sorry, I'm illiterate, I can't read or write, I can't fill these forms out. And so the pastor says, you can't fill these forms out? And he goes, no. He said, well, we can't hire you if you can't read or write. I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as our maintenance guy, you're going to have to read forms and, and written instructions and all this other things, so we can't hire you. So they, they, they gave him all of his wages, and then they gave him a little bit of a bonus because the pastor felt bad. This man goes down the street, he finds a farmer. And he takes the profits that he made from this job. He finds this farmer and says, you know what, I'd like to sell your vegetables. And so he bought some vegetables from this farmer. He set up like a roadside stand. And so he started selling vegetables. And then he'd take those profits. He'd go back to the farmer. He'd buy more vegetables. And then the farmer was so impressed by this man's business sense that he says, you know what, I'll exclusively sell vegetables to you. And so this man, I mean, his, his stand is like large now. After four years of this, he was operating in cash. He decided he needed to go down to the bank and open an account. So he took all this cash. What they said was almost a million dollars. And he took all this cash. He goes down to this local bank, and he says, I need to open a checking account. And the banker said, well, sure. And he says, he's, here's, a, here's an application form. Just fill this out, and we'll open your account. And the guy says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm illiterate. I can't read or write. And the banker was shocked because of his gifts and his abilities, his business sense. And so the banker looked at him and says, sir, do you know where you'd be in life if you could read or write? He goes, yeah, I'd still be the janitor at First Baptist Church. <laughs> and, and sometimes, listen, I'm telling you, sometimes weakness in our life, sometimes weakness in our life can be our greatest asset. This is what Paul's saying. Because you know why? 
it forces us not to depend on our ability, not to depend on our ingenuity, not to depend on our strengths, but when we, have, when we have to operate out of our weaknesses, all of a sudden we have to depend on him. When you look at Paul's life, you realize that he got this and he understood this at a deep level, that Paul came to the place to where he understood that, guess what, in my weaknesses I am made strong. Listen, there's so many of us that we want to hide our weaknesses. We want to deny our weaknesses. We want to excuse our weaknesses away. Have you ever thought maybe God wants to use your weaknesses? Have you ever thought that because in your weaknesses is when you depend on him? That's why Romans or 2 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, Boasting is necessary. It is not profitable, profitable, but I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. And Paul came to this place that he said, I, I had some spiritual highs. And maybe you've had those. Maybe when you accepted Christ or maybe at a camp. Or maybe at a young age, God called you to do something. Maybe recently God's called you and he's put a burden on your heart. And when you look at this, you realize that sometimes God calls us, God asks us to operate in our weaknesses so that we will depend on him. The second principle is this, is difficulties. When, when we understand being spiritual mature, then we understand difficulties are common in, in, normal, in the normal Christian life. Verse 7, he goes on and he says, especially because of the extraordinary revelations, therefore, so I will not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament. All the Old Testament prophets were not very impressive. They were farmers, they were sheep herders, they were big pickers. You look at the 12 disciples, none of them impressive at all. Fact is, they were unlearned. They weren't sophisticated. They didn't have seminary. They didn't have a lot of education. You look at what God did through them. Paul. Paul was sophisticated. He was a, Roman of, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Roman citizen. He, he, had a, he had a lot of education. And then all of a sudden, it says, the scripture says, that God gave him a thorn in the flesh. And there's a, there's a lot of debate, just real quickly, there's a lot of debate in theological circles as to, hey, what, what, was, that, what was that thorn in the flesh? And, and so some have thought it's relational problems, and thought it's, some have thought it's health issues, and epileptic seizures, some have thought it's a speech impediment, or fleshly temptations, uh, an estranged wife, a mother-in-law, um, that was a joke, <laughs> not much of a joke. I didn't say it last night when Karen was here, I'll tell you that. And I pray she's not live streaming now. Because <laughs> I love my mother-in-law. And so, and maybe it, was a maybe it was a constant earache. Maybe it was some physical appearance. But, but here's the interesting thing in the Greek, this word, this word steak. I mean, it's used for, in the Greek, it's used for torturing or impaling somebody. This was unbelievable pain that he was in. I mean, you realize that after Paul's first missionary journey, he traveled with a physician, Luke, uh, Dr. Luke, who traveled with him. And so I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I believe this weakness is. Um, and this is just, this is my personal opinion. It comes out of Galatians chapter 4, verse, verse 15. I think it had to do something with his eyes. I think it had to do something with his eyes and his appearance. Uh, because several times they would say he's unimpressive to look at. In scripture, sometimes it's like he was really hard to look at in, in preaching. And then you realize in Galatians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says, do you see what large letters I am writing to you? That I think he had an issue with his, with his eyes. And some people will tell you, you know what, as a Christian, as a Christian, you should never have any pain, you should never have any hurt, you should never have any loss, but have you thought? Have you just ever thought about that sometimes it's out of our pain that God bursts the ministry? Out of our weakness that God uses, out of our burden that God uses you and uses me to help people who have gone through a similar experience. The third and the last principle is this about spiritual maturity is we're, we're spiritually mature when we understand or we become grateful for our difficulties. Our weakness is a process. To we come, to, um, to come to the place to where you can look back on our life and say, you know what, I'm, I'm grateful for that struggle. I'm grateful for that weakness because you know what? In that struggle, I learned how to pray. 
In that struggle, I learned how to depend not on myself, but depend on God. In that struggle, I learned who Christ was. Verse 8, it says this, it says concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it, that it would leave me. Now, now just real quickly, when, when a Jew, and, and Paul was a Jew, whenever a Jew would tell you that I prayed three times, and a Jew did pray, uh, they prayed three times, uh, morning, noon, and, and then in the evening before they went to bed. And so, but, the, but really what they're trying to, what, what they're trying to communicate and what Paul's trying to communicate is he's saying, you know what, I, I continually pray for this. I continually prayed that God would remove him. I continually prayed that God would, would either heal him, uh, take care of the situation, remove this situation, remove this circumstance, remove this, 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 this thorn in the flesh. And here's the interesting thing. God never, listen, God never gave him an explanation. You know what God did? God gave him action. You know what God does with us so many times when we go through difficulty, me included, when we go through difficulty, when we go through hurt and pain, we start asking those why questions. Why did I have to go through this? Why did I have to deal with this? Why did I have to have this thorn? Why did I have to deal with this difficult circumstance? God, why can't you? And God never, never, God never gave an explanation. You know what he did? He always gave action. Well, here's what you should do. And that's what he does with Paul. And then he gave him a promise that I'll be with you. And that's where Paul came to the place where he says, you know what? I've just learned his, his grace. Man, his grace is sufficient. And his grace will take care of me. And Paul came to this place where he was grateful for his weaknesses. Verse, verse 9, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, I will most, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. When you look at the tense of these verbs in the Greek, you realize this is continual action. This may have been one of Paul's life verses. In my weakness, he is strong. His grace is sufficient for me. And that's why he goes on, verse 10, and says, So I take pleasure in weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ, because here's what I've learned. When I am weak, he is strong. And Paul looked at his weaknesses instead of being discouraged by them, that they help point him to God, they help point him to Christ. Weakness is any limitation or struggle that, that, that like, like we've inherited or that we, we cannot change. It is not a sin issue. It's just something, a weakness in, us, in our life that is just part. It may, be, it may be relationships. It may be a ha handicap. It may be a chronic illness. It may be low energy. It may be prone to depression. It may be a disability. It may be something emotional where there's a trauma scar or, or hurt of the past or abuse or to where, where you've lost a loved one. Or, and you may say, and you may say God can never use me because of. God says, that's your ministry. Isn't it true that when you go through a difficult time in life, you want to find someone that's gone through a similar experience as you because they can understand and they can minister to you and to help you. This is what Paul's saying. Paul is saying in the body of Christ, we minister to one another. Just as the comfort that we have found in him, we are willing to comfort others brothers and sisters we're family there's 56 commands in scripture that you can only live out in local church to love love one another if you have bible software uh, you can get that online you may own some bible software if you just do a word ser search on one another you'll find out in the in the in the new testament it comes up 56 times love one another pray for one another encourage one another support one another forgive one another Minister to one another, help one another, serve one another. You find all, and the only way you could do that is in the local church. And maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you're walking through like a difficult time. And maybe you just need to hear his grace. His grace is sufficient for you. And it's in our weakness, and it's in our struggles that we are strong. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you, what is God saying to you as a result of this message? And, and more importantly, what is your next step? 
every one of us in this room has a next step. And maybe for some of you, it's like a, it's just like a first step. Maybe it's just accepting Christ and coming to the place to ask him to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, where you put your trust in him and you believe that he is a resurrected Christ. And because of that, you can be totally and completely forgiven and that you can be deeply loved in him. And so maybe that's what you need to do here this morning. But maybe, listen, maybe you've already done that. Maybe you just need to find somebody and understand that in our weaknesses we are strong. You may need to find somebody to minister to, to encourage and to support. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I, I just need prayer. I'm a lot like Paul. And I'm walking through a difficult season in my life. I'm walking through a difficult time. And I don't know that I've come to that place to where I can say, you know what? His grace is sufficient. Maybe you haven't come to that place to where you can say, you know what? I I can appreciate that. And maybe today you're walking through a season and maybe you're just saying, you know what? I, I just need someone to pray for me. Whether it's a medical issue, a relational issue, maybe you want to pray for somebody else. Maybe it's something good and you just want to thank God for something or you, you're, you're, you have a decision to make this next week and you don't know which way to go and you just need wisdom and discernment. And sometimes, sometimes we just need someone to add their faith to our faith. Sometimes we just need someone to encourage us. And so if that is you this morning, that's what we want to do. We just want to pray for you. This is so easy to respond to. In just a few minutes, I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, we're going to stand. And when we stand, if you need prayer in any area of your life for any reason, would you just step out and begin making your way down to the front? There's going to be people walking with you. There's going to be prayer partners down here. There's something for every one of us to do in this, in this moment, whether we're standing and we're praying for those who are responding or we're responding. If you need prayer, if you're carrying a burden, just allow us to lift it. Allow us to add our faith to your faith and encourage you today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We just thank you for the power of your name. Would you just, would you just pull this body very closely to you? Would we remember that we're family, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ? And because of that, we love one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. We support one another. We forgive one another. And may we receive prayer this morning for those who who just need prayer. We just look forward to see what you're going to do, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? And as you stand, just real quickly, if you need prayer in any area of your life for any reason, we're not going to be in this moment long. You don't have to be a member of Fellowship the Rockies. This has nothing to do with membership. This has everything to do with ministry. So if you need prayer in any area of your life for any reason, if it's a medical issue, a financial issue, a relational issue, Maybe you're praying for discernment or a choice that you need to make. Maybe you need to pray for someone else. If you're carrying a burden, we just want to pray for you. If you're carrying a burden, listen, we want to pray for you. So just make your way down to the front. Listen, this will be your first time with us, and that is okay. We just want to encourage you. We have story after story what God has done in the front of this room when people have just humbled themselves and prayed. So just keep making your way down. We have plenty of prayer partners down here. We would love to pray for you and encourage you. You come. You just keep coming. People are still making their way down. We have plenty of prayer partners here. This is your moment. This is your time for us. This is like a holy moment. This is when we minister to one another. This is when we pray for one another. So you just keep making your way down. We'll guide you. We'll direct you. Tell us your name and how we can pray for you. And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you and encourage you. If you made a decision of any kind, we would love to know about that. We have baptism coming up. Maybe you've accepted Christ and you've never walked through the steps of believer's baptism. And so we would love to help you with that. You can fill out the the Connect card. You can get it several ways on the seat back in front of you. There's a QR code. You can use your smartphone and it'll come up that way. You can go out in the foyer uh, at the info desk. You can grab one there. Uh, If you're watching online, you can go to the top of the screen and, and click Connect card. And, um, and fill that out, and that will get to, uh, to us. Well, out of Jude, we've been using it as our benediction. And so may you receive this today as a word from the Lord. And here's what Jude writes. He says, Now to him who is able 
to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the God and our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time forever and ever. Amen. May you receive that as a word from the Lord for you today. God bless you. Thank you for being here.